Hello Unity fans! Today we will have a look at how we need to adjust Catlike Coding's basic hex map system to allow us to interact with individual resources on the map. Up until now, we've spawned basic urban, farmland and plants objects or prefabs randomly on the map according to a density set by the various sliders of the map editor. However, we stored only the density level of each feature for every cell. Whenever the features were drawn, the random number hash tables based on position would always cause them to be drawn in exactly the same way, and they were not allowed to change some of their characteristics over time. This is fine for purely aesthetical purposes, but it does not allow us to interact meaningfully with features or resources. In order to achieve this, we need our features prefabs to be more special than they currently are. We need to store a lot more information on them, write a lot more code to handle these interactions and align the visuals and animations to the interactions as well. This will eventually allow us to have a decently looking resource gathering system in place that has an actual effect on the game. Let's see how we can achieve this. In part 2 of this series, which I'll link to in the description and in the top right, we defined 7 specific positions on a hex, determined how features are assigned to the positions and how they are perturbed to add some randomness to the positions to prevent completely uniform placements. Since each of these positions can accommodate a resource, it makes sense to store the extra information we need in an array of 7 classes as part of the hex. But first, we also store the possible positions in an enum similar to the possible directions of the hex neighbors. Here, we also have a center position, which the directions did not have. We'll put resource-specific code in a new script called resources. Firstly, we create an enum for our resource types. We're only going to work with wood for now, and for initial testing and trying out approaches, I did use some hard coding for wood, but I really recommend formalizing it in this way quite early on in the process. In this way, you can only refer to valid resource types, so it reduces the probability of coding errors, having to go through the code to change hard-coded values, etc. It also makes standardizing methods for different resources a lot cleaner. We can change these values as we go along, but for now I've included these. Now we create a class called hex internal info to store all the information of a specific location on the hex. We need the position in world space. While world space can be converted to local space, I'm also storing the local position for now. Depending on future usage, I may decide to get rid of one of them eventually. Next, we need to store the resource type occupying that position and have a reference to the instantiated object itself. We also want to be able to specify the number of hits required to harvest the resource. For wood, this would be the number of chops the woodcutter need to make before the tree falls over and the wood can be gathered. Each cell now gets an array of length 7 of this resource information class, one for each position. When we generate features, after deciding which feature is added to a position, we also set the information of the new class. In order to confirm that we've stored the correct positions, we can draw a red line over each resource and make sure they align to the visuals of the resource. And if we look at the map, we see each feature now has a thin red line directly over it, indicating that we have the correct position stored. Since we made the internal info serializable, we can also see the values in the editor. If we find a hex with some trees on it, we can see all the info about the trees in the array elements of that hex. Now that we can tell which resource exists on each of the seven positions of a hex, we can let a unit automatically search for a hex that contains a tree, or wood resource. We already have a search algorithm that finds the path between a specified start and end hex, testing whether the current search hex equals the target hex on each step. We can adjust this to not search for a manually specified hex, but for the closest hex with a tree on it. The algorithm keeps considering the next nearest hex until one is found where one of the seven locations indicate the resource type wood in its hex internal info class. If all hexes are visited without a single tree being found, it stops and returns the devastating news to the woodcutter. Otherwise, it returns the path to the hex with the resident tree and the woodcutter can travel to that hex. 
Note that he is still travelling to the centre of the hex for now. This is the travel method we currently have available. We can also adjust this travel method to allow travel to internal locations within the hex. We add indicators for starting at an internal location and ending at an internal location. Now we need to adjust the target location of the unit slightly based on these options to let it walk straight to the resource when it gets to the target hex rather than the center of the hex. To decide which tree on the target hex to walk to, we find the tree that is closest to the hex in the travel path just before the target hex. This will ensure that the unit does not walk past trees to get to the one he'll chop down, but will start clearing the hex from the side that is approaching the target hex. We find this by calculating the distance between the tree and the previous hex for all trees and selecting the one with the minimum distance. Note that we draw a green line on the selected tree to test our search results. The unit now successfully finds the tree closest to him and we now need him to start chopping. But the model I've been using up until now does not contain a chopping animation. Only a crude sword slash which won't do. So we're going to have to say goodbye to this guy for now and bring in a real woodcutter. This guy looks the part, he's got the tools and his chopping animation is in place. So we'll use him from now on. However, there was a slight problem with his walking animation. If you look closely, you'll see that his left arm and leg both swing forwards or backwards together, and the same for the right side, making his walk look like that of a penguin. In order to correct this, I thought I would try inverting one half of his body's animation by playing the second half first and the first half second. I selected all the parts of the model above the pelvis and swapped the halves around. It fixed the penguin walk, but the upper body swayed too much during the walk. So I tried keeping the spine grouped with the lower body to reduce the movement, which gives us a non-penguin version of the woodcutter we will use from now on. We'll see how we get him to interact with the trees in the next video. Please stay tuned. Goodbye.